Hi, everyone. Uh, the Bitcoin Brief Show is back, and I will be joined today by Jimmy Song. Um, thank you, everyone. Oh, wait a minute. My bad. I don't think they heard me. My my my. Because <laughs> I, I I I'm back in 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 New York, and I didn't have my uh my workstation, so I I, I just realized I didn't have the right mic turn. Okay, here we go. Uh the Bitcoin Brief Show is back. Thank you all for uh, watching the live stream of the conference. I actually have to fly out tonight, um, so we're not gonna uh, we're gonna get right to it with Jimmy. We're gonna review the conference a little bit. Uh, we're gonna talk about the stories over the last couple of days, and I have to take a look at the price of Bitcoin. Uh, so much going on. We will be done at the top of the hour. We have one hour max, Jimmy uh welcome home and um what's going on uh just like i don't even know where to start man like <laughs> crazy uh you have to go teach your course uh -huh. Let's that's start right there. yeah I, I i mean we're back baby and it's been a crazy like uh you know week or so um, you know, I, I, uh, I think uh, the day before I came out to Vegas was when I started teaching the UT class that I'm teaching right now it's to a bunch of grad students. Um, I asked how many of them followed me. I think two people raised their hands out of like 52, uh, 52 people that were in the room. So um, it's an interesting class, a bunch of grad students, mostly uh, from CS, some from business. So um, that I, I need to go teach it again tonight. Um, unfortunately, that when I taught last week, I think I got sick, and I, I I've been I was sick throughout the entire conference at Unconfiscatable. I was giving people fist bumps instead of handshakes because I didn't want to get them sick. Um, but despite that, I managed to knock out Doug Polk at the poker tournament, so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, so got to be like one of my bucket list items, being able to beat a poker pro like Doug at in a tournament like that. So very happy. Yeah, no, actually, um, I'm going to uh, screen share right now uh, because we have a picture uh, <laughs> so here. So we put up some pictures. We have a lot more pictures we need to put up. By the way, the live stream of the conference and the poker game is here. Um, I haven't even had time. I want to timestamp all of the times I went all in, which was like six times. Some of them. Yeah, dude, uh, you, you, you were, you were like a cockroach that would not go away, man. Like just kept, kept, uh, coming back. Like somehow you beat aces with like a Jack five or something. Oh, there we go. That's, uh, that's me showing my scalp there. Uh, the Doug, Doug Polk scalp. I, I still have to like go do something with that open dime so I can get my money back for the entry fee. But yeah, no, was... you should put it on the wall, man. Yes, yeah, so you have a <laughs> you have an open dime with a bounty for knocking out Doug Polk. That should be framed, <laughs> man. That's 0.1 Bitcoin right there. Frame it with a picture of Doug Polk. Uh, lose it to you at poker. And put it on your wall, man. Don't 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 break the open. Well, dime. maybe 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 if I do it that way, it's worth more than 0.1 Bitcoin. I don't know. We'll 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 have to figure something out. But no, it, I really it, think you should because you could have like a, a premium on it in the future because that was the point one Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. No, no, these are great. Like, man, I wonder <laughs> if people are going to open those open dimes. Uh, yeah. Hey, and Rodolfo, man, shout out CoinKite uh, and Rodolfo for supplying open dimes. And uh, we and put the, the, the yeah. winning on there. Yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. I mean, like... Uh, there's there's a definitely a large crossover of poker and Bitcoin, so it was a lot of fun. I uh, we we definitely did a lot of uh, well, I did a lot of commentating because you were at the final table, um, and I, I got knocked down nineteenth. So yeah, it, it was um, despite my lack of com like voice or you know like just being sick and not like having talked like for eight hours that day, it was quite fun. It was quite. Uh, yeah, no, they, yeah, you were a trooper, man. You stayed on for the play-by-play. -play. Uh, so the winner of the poker game was Ben Peterson. Uh, he's not. He also knocked me out, by the way. He knocked me out with aces over sevens. Uh, that was quite tragic. I really shouldn't have gone all in there. Yeah, he's a really good guy. I mean, like, um, I, I knew him from before, and uh, Leah and Tyler know him as well. So he is, you know, uh, one of our fans. It wasn't one of the pro player ringers <laughs> that was there. I spent the entire table with Phil Locke uh, going all in against 
them. Uh, Jesus, like, I, if I yeah. if I knew he was in the game, I would have like made him a celebrity and put him as far away from me as possible, like with Doug Paul. <laughs> I don't even know how yeah, you same. ended up. I don't know how you ended up at a table with Doug Polk so early because uh, I was on table one, you were on table two, uh, Doug was on table two, you were on table three. So uh, mm -hmm. they were breaking out the, the larger number of tables going towards table one and two. I guess a lot of people got knocked out at your table and the tournament director yeah. was forced to break up your table early. Yeah, yeah. We had like four guys get knocked out and, uh, and basically I, I – got a random slip and I happened to sit two seats next to Doug and uh, he, he acted after me uh, and you know ace king over ace jack and somehow my ace jack held up um, so I yeah I, I knocked them out purely because of luck <laughs> all right cool but yeah guys hey if you want to recap I, I do want to I'm going to find someone to edit the poker video I know we had some sound issues in the beginning next year this is all going to go a lot smoother with uh, I mean, the live stream issues were resolved for the uh, for the conference uh, next year. The guys fully understand what is needed. Uh, this is going to go really good next year. We'll look more like ESPN, but we're probably not going to do, you know, card camps. Right. Yeah, that's yeah, probably yeah. not going to happen. Uh, wearing the T-shirt. It's great. All right. Hey, we got a lot of stories to cover. Uh, I mean, like I can't I don't have time to thank everyone that was involved in the conference that came to the conference. Um, I, I might have to do a separate video, like a conference recap. I just have not had time at all. And um, I, I will say this. Hey, so one of my most memorable <clears throat> comments. So somebody said this to me during like the, the after party. And it wasn't even, and it was, uh, I think it was the wife of one of the, one of our followers, but she's been to like a few events, not just in crypto, but also like general events. And, and this is the one that really stood out. I'm sorry. I forgot the names of the people that said it. She goes like this. She's like, I think this is the first conference I've ever attended in my life where not a single person tried to sell me anything. <laughs> That's a very good thing. That's a very good thing. I mean, that, that really resonated, right? And I'm like, you're right. There's nobody there except merchandise. Like, that was the only thing being sold is like, like <laughs> shirts and hats. Yeah, it's, it's much more honest than, uh, you know, money that somebody's trying to print so yeah that's that's a very good thing all right cool all right let, 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 let's let, let's get to the stories let's try to cover stuff i don't know if we'll have a show tomorrow because i'm flying overnight to paris uh mm. we'll try to do a show tomorrow but i'll be on european time let's uh let's jump to bitmain uh, mm. uh again do we expect them to survive into 2020 <laughs> uh so they published on their blog post uh, what they're looking for for 2019. I skimmed through it. I believe you read it, Jimmy. Um, I think at this point, they might as well say that they have like a three nanometer chip because they're not efficient. Like, like what are they doing? Well, uh, I mean, they, they lost some talent. I mean, they're, they're trying to uh, put the best spin that they can on what happened in 2018. Um, honestly, it was a terrible year for them. They bet way too much on Bitcoin Cash. Um, and then bet too much on Bitcoin ABC. Um, you know that that that's been a major part of uh, of their story. Um, you know they they started the Sofon Tech uh, sort of AI based uh, ASIC chips uh, that didn't go anywhere. Uh, from what I hear, like the, that entire department got completely devastated. So they they don't really have anybody. Um, doing anything in that regard. Uh, their IPO, that, that didn't go well at all. They tried to raise an additional round of money before the IPO. That didn't go well at all either, um, largely because of their large uh, holding of uh, BCH. Um, you know, they, they sold off a ton of assets. Um, they lost a lot of talent. It's just, it, I mean, it's about as bad a year as you can, uh, you can imagine for Bitmain. And they tried to take that, and make it sound good in this blog post, which is um, which is interesting because most companies will do that, of course. Uh, but you know the fact that they're not going to IPO, that they're not going to get a large influx of cash. Um, I don't know who you raise money at, uh, from at this point without it being like a giant down round. So, I, I th this is a company that's in some significant trouble. You have um, you know McCree and Jihan apparently feuding. They stepped down as co CEO. Um, you, you have a new CEO now. They have 
uh, you know, they're touting all these minor things that they did. Really, it's, um, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, most of these like, uh, you know, like uh, shitcoin ASIC uh, miners or whatever, uh, you know, Monero got pissed off enough at them that they just switched the proof of work on them and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine uh, this this bodes very well. And it, it, the, the entire post kind of reads like, um, you know, a lot of spin. And that's that's kind of what it is. Yeah, but like Monero flipping proof of work on them. I mean, I don't understand why. Like you have to be a complete buffoon in this space not to realize that Monero is totally centralized, that it can do that anytime they wishes. <laughs> and um, you need to, again, not be a buffoon to realize that you shouldn't be creating, spending money on research and development of shit coins, including Monero. Yeah, and uh, and they spent a lot of money on Dash, on Monero, on Zcash, on Ethereum, and I mean they they've been doing this for a while, and uh, and you know I mean to be fair, that's what they were good at that that they they know how to make ASIC chips and uh, you know create miners that are more efficient. Turns out though, even those weren't that efficient, uh, that much more efficient than say like GPUs and things like that. Uh, so, you know, I mean, they've been bleeding technical talent for a while um, and haven't been compensating their chip designers probably at the level that they should have. And I, I imagine that's probably one of their biggest regrets is is not uh, not keeping the, the really talented chip designers on board to create the next generation of seven nanometer chips and so on. Um, and that's come back to bite them big time. If you're a research and development company, you need to make sure that your research and development is top notch through and through. They were that about two or three years ago. It looks like they no longer are. And that's, uh, that's at the heart of where, why they're uh, struggling so much as they are. All right, uh, let's move on. Uh, let's go over to uh, the BIS. So the Bank of International Settlements uh, published a paper saying that uh, Bitcoin's problem is proof of work. Like, like you really can't make this shit up, right? Uh, kind of wanted to say for Dean on this episode to talk about this. This was great. I'm actually mad that like, how come I'm not tagged in this tweet? Like the reply. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically the Bank of International Settlements. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like a horse and buggy manufacturer saying that cars have no future or something like that. It really doesn't make any sense. I mean, their their entire worldview is based on like. Um, you know, being able to control money and uh, government being a force of good all the time and and that central banks by printing and having uh, being able to control the elasticity of money will be able to, um, you know, add something to civilization when we know that they don't add anything to civilization whatsoever. They're rent seekers. They just, uh, you know, take everybody else's money and uh, we redistribute money and like pick winners and losers and all sorts of things like that. Um, you know, their, their analysis of proof of work is about as naive as you could, uh, you, you, you would think. Uh, they don't really understand uh, what mining centralization does or what the game theory behind it is. They just want governments to control money. Oh, well, and, Jimmy, no, no, they, they did not. They, they, they did not. Uh, get into the the minutia of mining centralization. That's way that's way more advanced. That they that they no no. It's in there. It's a, it's in the thirty one oh, page. In there. Yeah yeah. It's a, it's a very long paper. Uh, oh, okay, but no, yeah, because I lo I looked through some of it and it was all focused on well, uh, pretty soon there won't be a mining reward and then no one's going to mine. Uh, that that was yeah. the, I thought that was their main point. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a large part of it. And they're saying proof of stake would be better or something like that. Right, but proof, yeah, of, stake, it, it, right, proof yeah. of stake requires infinite money printing, which is the only thing that they know. Yeah, and they're, they're yeah, I it's mean, it's secure. like sort of uh, verbal diarrhea, um, like put on paper or something like that. It's it, it it's really not worth looking at. It, it really is a horse and buggy manufacturer making an argument of, uh, you know, instead of uh, for like against cars, that's that's really what it sounds like to me. All right. Well, well, well we're gonna stick with mining since uh, you know we covered Bitmain and you just mentioned it. So you wrote an op-ed for Bitcoin Magazine talking about how the fifty-one percent of tax 
on Bitcoin specifically, or the risk of a 51% attack on Bitcoin is uh, grossly overblown. You want to give us a quick summary, but everyone, all of these links are in video description, by the way, guys. So just go right there, click the links and read them over. You want to give us a little TLDR on your article? Sure. It's, uh, I mean, basically it's very, very hard to do a 51% attack because not only do you need the mining equipment, but you also need the electricity. And both those things are very, very difficult to get. You can't just get them off the shelf. Um, for certain altcoins that, uh, that is not true, you can actually just go buy hash power uh, related to the proof of work for that particular coin. I, I believe that's how the Ethereum Classic uh, one was much easily, uh, much more easily, um, fifty-one percent attack. But even if, uh, even if you uh, could go get all of that stuff, uh, the key thing that I point out is that you can make a lot more money being an honest miner, and that's a lot easier in in, in many ways. Um, and one of the things I point out is that this is not a systematic failure. This is a partial vulnerability to a part particular form of attack for a particular set of people, namely exchanges. Uh, but, uh, but it's not, it, it's uh, like the way all coiners use the term like mining centralization, they make it sound like it is uh, like if you can, uh, if you can, it, you, it, it gives you control of the entire network permanently. And that's simply not true. That's uh, and this is the difference between like all coin centralization, which is complete takeover of the coin. You can do whatever you want with the coin versus mining 51% attack, which is a particular form of attack that makes a few people very vulnerable. Um, you know, and one of the things that I, I point out is that, you know, it's, it's possible that I, I kind of want to see a 51% attack happen uh, in part, because if you do have that, then it'll prove, okay, well, first of all, it doesn't affect everybody. Um, and it only really affected like the exchange that got screwed over out of a hundred uh, Bitcoin or something like that. And people tend to think that's a, a, a system-wide failure. No, it isn't. It's just that one exchange that did, didn't do enough confirmations, uh, that, that wasn't careful enough. Um, and in, in many ways, I, I would expect that if a 51% attack like that happened and you know, uh, some exchange got screwed out of a hundred Bitcoins, that ultimately what would happen is the Bitcoin price would rise because it would show that it is anti-fragile and that, you know, like mo most people aren't affected at all. And that all you need to do is, is, is just be a little more careful with confirmations and you're good to go. Um, and that, that's, uh, it's, it's not a systematic vulnerability. That's, uh, yeah, sorry. Ran a little long there, but that's, no, that's no, what no, it's fine. No, it's <laughs> fine. And I will just add to it briefly. And uh, I'm sure Jimmy uh, fully describes the technological difficulty with the 51% attack on Bitcoin uh, very well. If you go beyond that, beyond the technological issues of attacking Bitcoin with 51%, you got to talk about A, the social um, aspect of it. And, and this is what I've been saying for years in not attacking uh, any altcoin other than bitcoin is very easy because you can always move that money into bitcoin and run away attacking mm. bitcoin is there's no profit there like it's impossible like there is no profit there yeah so how are you gonna get the money out yeah <laughs> right. so the only entity that is incentivized to do this would be a government entity that can print the money and it doesn't need to hack the money right so you, you've just eliminated a large chunk of people that would like to attack uh, your chain. And that's not a problem for Bitcoin. Not to mention what Bitcoin Cash hasn't realized. The fact that this could happen is a feature of Bitcoin. And we want it to be a feature of Bitcoin because the Bitcoin as a, a currency, uh, Bitcoin as money needs to grow with confidence over time. And the fact that it could happen, but isn't happening adds to that confidence. When you put in a checkpoint, you are killing the confidence of your currency being, you know, politically neutral. So the fact that this could happen or the fact that there could be a reorg of Bitcoin blocks going back, you know, God knows how many blocks, like, like, like the fact that the, the, there is no checkpoint is the, a good thing for Bitcoin, not a bad thing. And most people get that shit backwards.
Yeah, it's it make it's what makes it the it, it's uh, one of the proofs that it's decentralized. It, it, there's an objective metric that everyone adheres to instead of some central authority saying this is the block that is uh, canonical um, and that's it. Uh, but I mean, we we've known Bitcoin Cash is, uh, is centralized for a long time. I mean, I mean, so is almost every altcoin, and that they have to be that way in part because they were all second or third or nth. Um, in this race. And basically, uh, the only way they can keep their coin going is really by centralizing it to a large degree. Hey, Jimmy, I think there's something wrong with my microphone. All right, you sound fine to me. <laughs> um, the live streamers are the, the, the people watching are complaining. Is, is it better now? I, I I don't know. I don't see any difference, but that well, might be. No, I, got, uh, I got a few comments. <laughs> okay. See. It's always on a little delay, but um, maybe I can also kill my video for a minute here. Um, okay. Okay. We're good now. All right. I guess we're good. All right. All right. Let's keep going. All right. Let's keep going. We got two more quick stories. Uh, you know what? Let's save the most important one for, oh, actually we got three stories. Damn. Let's save the most important one for last. Let's go to the CBOE and Van Eyck canceling their attempt to create a Bitcoin physically uh, backed ETF. I have been saying this for two years. The ETF is not coming. I don't want to say anything else. Please go back and watch the videos between January and March of 2017. There is nothing that I said there that isn't as true today as it was two freaking years ago. Uh, you you it's not coming. I, it, it, oh God. All right. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't know why so many people get, uh, so excited. I mean, yeah, maybe there's like a brief influx because now you can just uh, buy the ETF, but there's, there was always going to be a giant premium on it. And the people in the know would have just, uh, you know, figure, figured out a, way to arbitrage off that anyway um i mean i i and honestly the the people that are interested in bitcoin already have some bitcoin um maybe there's some mild interest or people that aren't that convicted about bitcoin that want to diversify into it a little bit uh that would come in uh that wouldn't otherwise but those are not really the investors that you want. You want people that actually believe it in, in it as a store of value. Um, and I mean, we saw a really big bubble at the end of 2017. I think you'd see the mother of all bubbles if we had an ETF. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure that would be great. Um, so I mean, just something to think about. All right. Um, yeah. And they're also saying because of the government shutdown, the, you know, the, 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 they just want to waste any more time. And I agree. You're wasting time. Go mm. do something productive. For two years they've been mm. trying to do it. I could have told them two years ago. Don't expect it anytime soon. I did. Tell oh, it's them. been way longer than two years ago. Uh, I mean, yeah. Winklevoss twins, I think, started in 2014, 2015. Yeah, so. no, that's when they started. But like... Um, it didn't become yeah. popular until the, 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 the first decision by the SEC in March of 2017. All right, we got two more stories to cover. Uh, this is interesting. So Blockstream is getting in the stablecoin game. Um, mm. I'm a little surprised, but, um, and, and we kill stablecoins on this show all the time. So uh, Blockstream is involved in creating a stablecoin uh, with uh, the Japanese yen. Uh, so I, I'm actually, I, I'm kind of okay with this. Like, uh, so there's two, uh, like, like stable coins are as a concept, uh, are ridiculous. I mean, borderline ridiculous, right? I mean, it's just government currency on a database, right? I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. all it is. I mean, there, there's no, there's no, there's nothing there. Now what makes every stable coin other than this stable coin even more stupid is that they're building the stable coins on top of um, unstable uh, central, like, like unstable databases with all the disadvantages of decentralization uh, and none of the advantages of, you know, being censorship resistant, right? So like building your stable coin on Ethereum, building your stable coin on Omni, building your stable coin on anything other than Bitcoin adds technological risk 
to something that the world probably doesn't even need, right? So at least in this case, right, I'm happy for two things. One, they're building a stable coin on top of a blockchain they're supposed to be building a stable coin on top of, which is Bitcoin. If you're gonna build this thing, at least build it on a sound technological platform, which is Bitcoin, not Ethereum. The other thing that I'm happy about is that Blockstream has a revenue stream because contrary to conspiracy theory, Lightning does not create a profit for Blockstream, right? And um, so this is a revenue stream consulting uh, to do something stupid for the Japanese yen, uh, but they get to make money on it. And, uh, and I'm happy about that. They can afford, they can pay more developers. Uh, Jimmy, your thoughts? Well, I mean, fully backed stable coins, actually, I think is, you know, that kind of makes sense. It's a, it's a, no, it's Jimmy, a Jimmy, no, I mean, it, it, it makes sense, but it's fully backed by, you know, an infinitely printable fiat, right? So it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a digital version of dollars you already know. It's just, uh, it's more uh, movable. It's faster. You don't have to use bank wires to transfer them and stuff like that. So there's a lot of uh, benefits that you can have with a fully backed stable coin. So I, I'm not necessarily opposed to any of those. Um, the, the thing is making sure that it's actually fully backed is the hard part. And uh, you need to examine an audit, the uh, actual bank account or something like well, that. No, no, no. Can I, can I, can I interrupt you for a second? I think the hard, the, I don't think that's the hard part. I think that's doable. I think the hard part is building it on top of something legitimate like Bitcoin. I think the hard part is. I don't think it's that hard. What do you mean? Everyone's a shit coin or everybody wants to build this thing on top of Ethereum. Everyone wants to sell their scam coin because they're saying that you need our scam coin to process the stable coin. Like you need the Ethereum coin to process the stable coin. Like, like the hard part is understanding what a blockchain is. The hard part is getting, building this thing on top of Bitcoin, like conceptually convincing people, hey, no, you shouldn't build your own money, print your own token, garbage token, in order to build the Japanese stable coin. Like I think the hard well, part so is conceptual. I, I, I don't think that's the hard part. I mean, like creating the coin and really it's not hard for us. It's not hard for us, but like a Joe Lubin and his consensus consulting company of 20,000 employees are out there convincing P, like the Japanese government to build their stable coin on top of Ethereum. Like the hard part is getting. I mean, no, nobody, nobody actually has done that. I mean, I, or I mean, they might have, but it's not at all popular. And uh, generally, if you, I mean, we know that. Well, so here's the thing: the uh, the entire stablecoin thing is massively centralized. It has to be because you have to back it somewhere, and the controller of the bank account actually is the centralized party. So it has to be centralized. So everyone knows it needs to be a centralized database. So. Um, as far as I can tell, most of these stable coins are very openly, um, you know, centralized. Uh, we know like Bitfinex owns Tether and all that stuff. Um, well, and and, and Jimmy, and what, have and what, been about, well, like, Tether, Tether. But Tether is built on top of Omni. Omni has its own token. Mm -hmm. But you don't what? need the Omni token to trade Tether. You, you, you can just uh, trade Tether straight. I mean, like it's 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 a central database. That's all it is. That's uh, I, I, mean, I that's know, I know. So what I, what I'm saying is the, the the hard part is getting these people to understand that if you're going to build it, you need to build it on top of Bitcoin. Not I don't think that's the hard part. I think you can build it on whatever centralized database you want, and most of the time it'll just work because you're already centralized. But they're building I mean, it on top of Bitcoin, which is not a but but they're building it on top of Bitcoin, which is not a centralized database. No, no. Um, I, most, I mean, Omni is pretty centralized on top of Bitcoin, despite, despite, I mean, Omni runs on top of Bitcoin and uh, so does Counterparty and things like that. The, the, I, I, I think this is where we're, where we're having a big disconnect because the hard part isn't building the, sec te the technology. The technology is really easy. It's a centralized database and 
you give people accounts that say you have this much or that much, and then you let people transfer them uh, more or less anonymously, which may run into securities or regulatory hurdles or whatever. Um, the hard part is making sure that it's actually fully backed. Um, and that requires audits and things like that. Um, and, you know, we've been looking for some sort of like a clean audit from uh, Tether for like a few years now for that reason. Uh, but I mean, that's one aspect of it. I, I mean, th this particular product, um, getting back to sort of the original story, uh, it, it's on Settlenet, which is a liquid side chain of, uh, of Bitcoin. Um, and liquid, of course, is the, is the uh, side chain that Blockstream created uh, for, you know, transferring uh, not just Bitcoins really quickly, but other assets because you can create assets on that chain. And this is one of the assets that they've created is Japanese yen. Again, it's very clear that it is a centralized token and that's okay. And uh, being able to transfer very quickly among the people that already are transferring Bitcoin back and forth very quickly makes sense. Um, and, and, you know, doing it on the side chain where it's not going to pollute the Bitcoin blockchain like uh, Tether or whatever it does, uh, that's a very good thing as well. So, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. It, it, it has some uses. Uh, I, I'm skeptical as to like how much that how much further that goes just because of AML KYC laws that are all over the world. Uh, but I mean, that's that's the idea, right? Like it, it um, it's not hard to create a stable coin, right? Like it's uh, it's you have a centralized entity. I could create one right now with a SQL database. And, uh, you know, I I can claim to have 20 trillion dollars in there. Uh, but like, there's no, I, if I don't supply an audit, there's no way for you to know. So, uh, you know, I mean, that, that to me is the biggest risk and the hardest part of like trusting these stable coins is making sure that the money is actually there when you're trying to withdraw it and it's not going to be that systemic collapse. And, and, and the Bitcoin blockchain can't help you with that. No, I, uh, I don't I don't think it really adds that much at all. I mean, yeah, you get maybe a little bit more security. I The, the way I understand the story is that the, the only reason they put the Japanese yen on this particular one is because you have the side chain with Bitcoin uh, being able to be traded on it very quickly. And if you want to do settlement yen for um, Bitcoin or something like that, then then it's massively convenient to have, have the yen there. I have a simpler explanation. The reason mm -hmm. why it's being built on, on top of Bitcoin is because these particular people that are building this particular stable coin decided to go to the smartest people in the room and say, hey, we want a stable coin. How do we build it? And that's how they ended up using Blockstream as their consultants. And that's how it's ending up on the liquid side chain. I mean, that might be true. I, I, I don't I don't really know. But I mean, if I if I were on liquid, that's uh, that's one of the things I would want to see are some stable coins on there because you want to be able to do atomic swaps with Bitcoin. And uh, if you're if you're tra and like the entire idea of the liquid side chain is so that you can move coins from one exchange to another really, really quickly. And you could do that like like in one second instead of you know 10 minutes or 60 minutes or however long it takes on the bitcoin main chain um but in order to do that trade you you might need to send some coins back and forth uh like some something else uh with, of equivalent value on uh you know uh in the other direction which is what a, a the Japanese yen can uh, stable coin can enable, but again, it's centralized and um, they're very clear about it, and that's that's good. Uh, and you know, you should know all stable coins are centralized. All all coins, for that matter, are stable uh, are centralized. Um, and any asset that's on liquid, other than Bitcoin, uh, well, I mean, to some degree, liquid uh, the bitcoins on the liquid side chain are are, are at least federated in the sense that like. 11 of the 15 people that do the signing off can basically steal it from you. But this is why they have 15 different jurisdictions and uh, exchanges that uh, are very unlikely to cooperate in that particular way. And that's that's why they have it that way. So, I mean, that that's the security model around the side chain. And in a, in a side chain like this, it makes sense to have a stable coin like this so that you can trade all sorts of assets and things like that. Yeah, and um, also I see that uh, Joey Ito has been quoted in this article out of the MIT Media Lab. 
Uh, again, uh, he hates every single ICO that has ever existed. So I like the names that are involved in this thing. Now I do have a comment in the live chat uh, and it says building it on top of Bitcoin is stupidest thing to do. Um, I'm leaning in that direction as well. Uh, however, it's a significantly like infinitely more stupid thing to do to build it on top of any other blockchain. Well, they're not really building it on top of Bitcoin. They're building it into Liquid, which is a side chain. Um, the side chain has the ability to take Bitcoin, like to do um, a two-way peg with the main chain, which is great, but that's only for Bitcoin. You can't transfer anything else out of it. And it, it's really only there so that uh, you can facilitate trades within that side chain only. Um, and that's it, it's it's a way to make uh, liquid much more useful by having the stable coin there. It's not really quote unquote building on top of anything really other than the liquid sidechain and uh, and that's that's very different than Bitcoin and it's something that uh, blockstream built without anyone's permission. It's permissionless innovation for that reason. All right, Jimmy, so let's get to the, the big story that I saw yesterday. I don't know if you um, had a chance to glance at it. It just came across my radar yesterday. Uh, Brian Trolls um, and their um, Block Digest podcast, uh, they are basically raising all kinds of hell uh, on Bitfury and their Lightning implementation because they took, took a look at their terms um, of service. So here, I'll just read a couple of tweets. I don't know if you've looked into it. Um, and it says, they collect um, <laughs> a fuck ton of data on everything you do on Lightning, share it with all affiliates, um, uh, sub, sub subsidiaries, which include Crystal Chain Analysis. And Crystal Chain Analysis is Bitfury's project uh, to assist law enforcement in identifying Bitcoin transactions. Uh, Google Analytics and explicitly lay out handing data over to law enforcement as a legal use under their terms. Um, he then followed up. Um, also, they allowed themselves to divulge any data they collect in a legal defense of themselves, including for fraud protection, credit risk, as well as allow themselves uh, to transfer all data to anyone who buys any of their business assets or is just interested in buying it. Um, so that is in regards to Bitfury's lightning implementation. Uh, general thoughts on that. And Alex Petrov is someone we really, really like. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, I spent a lot of time with him. Uh, I, I'm planning to spend more time with him, uh, but this, uh, this is not good, is it? No, and I, I'm going to guess that it was some lawyer in their company that basically told them if we don't do this, then we're going to get really, really screwed and that, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be in a lot of trouble and that it has a lot of legal risk. That's what I'm going to guess. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty awful. You, you, I, I, I wouldn't want to use any of their services at this point. And I know they uh, did the whole lightning peach thing and they, they have a bunch of products that are that are coming out but who's going to use them after terms of service that are that bad um i mean they they frankly they just need to go and fix it they need to go and fix it and if they don't fix it then good luck getting any customers because uh none of us are going to be that interested um unless you i don't know like pay us to use it maybe maybe then uh but well, probably well here's the thing right like is there a uh is there going to be a simple workaround? Because these things are unavoidable. I mean, Bitfury is a very large global company and I'm sure their uh, crystal chain analysis has brought them a lot of revenue uh, while Bitcoin was still not very fungible. But Bitcoin is going to be fungible. So for example, if I'm going to go through uh, Bitfury's lightning node, uh, can, I, do, can I have a couple of, you know, decentralized trusted nodes like i know a couple of friends like i know your lightning node is not going to collect info on me and francis's node is not going to collect and giacomo's node is it possible for me to mandate the rerouting of every transaction i do to go through you know a couple of my friends that are running lightning nodes i know this isn't the best way to decentralize a system but is this something that no i mean but that's that's uh, it, it depends on who you choose to open uh, lightning channels with um one 
uh, as long as you uh, trust the immediate connections that you make, then yeah, everything should be fine. Um, but I mean, they're, they're collecting a lot of other data that might be available on the network and they might be able to like sort of figure out certain things about where you are, who you are and what you're doing. So, um, I mean, just information leakage at any point is not a good thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, you're, you're still, you still have some degree of privacy, but how much is the real question? Because, you know, I mean, if they can piece together that you're the one that actually ordered this thing, then that might be, that might be enough. All right, so we will definitely revisit the story in the future. And is the solution more lightning nodes with uh, some kind of, I mean, I'm expecting lightning when it's all said and done, I'm expecting lightning to have way more fungibility and privacy than on-chain transactions. Or am they I already do. Yeah, they already do. Um, the, the, I mean, it's kind of like trying to prevent the NSA from running like full Bitcoin nodes and like being able to figure out that certain transactions came from this place or that place. I mean, there, there are already a bunch of firms that do that on the Bitcoin network. You can't prevent anyone from, uh, you know, being a lightning node and uh, opening uh, channels and things like that. It's a voluntary network. So that means that sometimes people that don't have the best interests at heart, um, you know, have access to some uh, data. But I mean, that's why the lightning standard is uh, has been created the way it has. It, it, it's so that you don't really need to trust anybody along the way. And it tries to be very privacy preserving along the way. So um, hopefully you don't leak very much, but the fact that, I mean, like the, this story, I think uh, is basically telling us that Bitfury is kind of like a bad actor, uh, on the network that you probably don't want to, uh, connect to their nodes until they like change up their terms of service. All right. Um, uh, we should probably get to the price. I only have about 15 minutes before I have to start packing. And um, I do want to let people know that we created a new YouTube channel uh, for the Unconfiscatable Conference because it is going to happen again and again and again. This becomes an annual thing. And uh, there is an Unconfiscatable Conference YouTube channel. All of the individual uh, standalone videos are being posted to that channel now. Probably in a day or two, all of them will be there. So if you don't want to you know, look through the 10-hour live stream on my YouTube channel, uh, you can go ahead and watch these things individually on the Unconfiscatable YouTube channel. So you can just go ahead and click on it. This is what it looks like. We currently have 24 subscribers. Okay. So we got a <laughs> long, we got, we got a long way to go there. Uh, 26. Uh, excellent guys. So please check <coughs> uh, subscribe <laughs> to this channel. Um, I think by next year, I'll probably have to live stream the whole thing again on my channel, but this is where the individual videos will be. Hey, um, my video is the most popular 45 whole views. Yay. There you go. Um, yeah, that's yeah. the Bitcoin development. Your other one, um, it's public. On zero. There. <laughs> no, I haven't, I haven't tweeted it out yet. That's why I only, I, I, I tweeted this one out already. Um, uh -huh. I have to apologize to Juan, uh, Juan, Jan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have to apologize to Jan because like he came on the panel last minute instead of the CTO. So the name Powell is under his uh, when he's speaking. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're going to have to be more efficient on that next time. Um, yeah, the conference went absolutely great. Hey, guys, uh, go check out the website. We have the full live streams there along with some pictures. We're going to have a lot more pictures posted. And um, probably in about three months, we're going to open up registrations for next year. We're already close to getting a date uh, and uh, it's going to happen again. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, you're, you're traveling to Paris and then you're going to be at the uh, London uh, Advancing Bitcoin Conference, correct? Yeah. Are you gonna yeah, do yeah. A hold on. Hold on. Hold on a second. I'm not sure what. Um, let me just switch screen shares real quick. Um, mm -hmm. Share screen and this one. Okay. So yeah, so I haven't even had time to talk about my travel schedule. I am going to Paris. I'm flying out tonight. So immediately after this, 
uh, I gotta, I gotta pack and I gotta run to the airport. Uh, this, uh, I don't know. It's, it's hard. It's hard, man. And then from <laughs> there, uh, we have the carnivory dinner in London and, yep. um, uh, yeah, we got the carnivory dinner in London, Jimmy, this, uh, this is all you, um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I, uh, but I'll be there. I'll be there, but, uh, uh, just incredibly busy. Th- thank you for organizing this and setting this up. And um, mm-hmm. after that, Jimmy and I are both speaking at Advancing Bitcoin Conference in London, uh, 7th and 8th of February. And from there, I am off to Thailand to speak yes. at Tra- Traders Fair Thailand. Uh, that's where I'm speaking next. I may go to Hong Kong after that to speak at another conference, but that's not official. After that, I come back to Europe and I will be speaking in Vienna at the end of February at the European Blockchain Investment Congress. And um, uh, th- there might be a few other events in Europe. It, it's just like it's not fully definite yet. Um, and then so, the, the, so those are the definite ones uh, for the month of February. Mm. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty hectic schedule. I, I I try to keep it to one a month. You're you're doing like five the next month or something. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and the, oh, the the Bitcoin Standard bearer thing is behind me, but now that the sun is dimming, you can't see it. Uh, yeah. All right, I gotta I gotta do price real quick. Oh, uh, well, can I can I just show my uh, my seminars real quick? Yeah, so I I have one right after Advancing Bitcoin 9th and 10th in London. And I also just announced that I will be doing one in New York City right after uh, Consensus 2019. So that will be May um, 16th and 17th. uh, And that'll be a lot of fun as well. I'm I'm trying to plan out a little bit better this this year, guys. you know, trying to, uh, you know, limit my traveling to about once a month and so on. New York City, May 16th and 17th. I will probably do the same thing. I'm going to do my workshop around consensus as well. I just don't know uh-huh. if it's going to be on the front end or the back end. That's on the back end, right? Yeah, the front end actually might have the Magical Crypto Friends Conference, which is like, I think, supposed to be 11th and 12th. Consensus is 13, 14, 15. So that's why... Schedule. Yeah, so I might do mine on the uh, around the same days as Jimmy. Are uh, are those weekends, sixteen, seventeen, or Thursday, Friday? Thursday, Friday. Okay, so mine would probably be on Saturday. I always do mine. I might since mine is a one day. It's always a weekend day. So I will. Mm. I'll probably get on that next week. Yep. Tone, you're you're frozen. I'm frozen. Yeah, you were frozen for a second, but you're you're good now. Okay, I'm good now. All right, let, let, let's go to uh, let's go over to price, uh, Jimmy. You have to go teach your course at the University of Texas. I do, um, and uh, I, I got to get there at least like an hour ahead of time because uh, I'm I'm giving them uh, an exam, so <laughs> I need to make sure that that's all easily gradable and everything else. But so uh, thanks, guys. Um, I'll let Tone do the price for the next ten minutes. But this song is done. All right, thank you, Jimmy. Thanks for. Thanks for joining me on this show. All right, guys, let's go take a look at the price and uh, take it from there. Um, I, I have to make it quick, unfortunately. Maybe I'll do one from the airport before I get on my flight and, and we'll do some more price stuff. Um, okay, that should be viewable. Let me check. Let me make sure. Okay. Okay. So here's the monthly chart. The monthly chart is going to update in a few hours. I believe we are lower than. Now to close at a brand new month, intro month low, uh, but the closing is the key and the month is almost over. We are, oh, tw- today's the 29th already. Jeez, the month is literally almost over. So. Uh, this is not good. I mean, it's a very bearish sign. Uh, this is looking like a, do- a double bottom situation in the vicinity of 3000. And very, very likely we're going to go lower than 3000 and perhaps significantly. Let's take a look at the weekly chart. Uh, oops, let me make, let me zoom this in, make that bigger. Here's the weekly chart. We are off the weekly lows, but not by much. Uh, the low, the intra week low has been. 
3322. Uh, we are currently back above 3400. I mean, the probability of whatever low this was, 3143, the probability of that low being the final low is maybe 5%, like maybe 1%, maybe half a percent. Well, like I have all confidence we're going lower. Now, I had all the confidence in the world that we're going to go sub at least to 5,000, you know, back in April of the year. Uh, but it took us, you know, six more months to get there, right? So when I say I have 95% confidence that we're going lower than 3,100, it can take us another six months to go lower than that. Like you want it to be as soon as possible to finally bottom out and start an uptrend. Nobody wants another, you know, nine month long descending triangle. At least I don't want it, right? But we can have that. If we fall to approximately 3,000, then go up to 4,000, and then we fall to 3,000 and go up to 3,750, and then we fall to 3,000 and go up to 3,500, then we fall to 3,000 and go up to 3,250. I mean, this can last all the way into next January this way, right? And it will create another, it will create a 12 month descending triangle. And then the breakdown of that triangle will be approximately, you know, $1,000. And then you fall from 3,000 to 2,000. But you want that to happen like next month instead of a year from now. But it's going to happen. Okay. Um, so um, I am expecting a breakdown to sub 3,000 when I have absolutely no idea. Uh, so, but right now the weekly chart is looking very bullish. Last week we had a red two going below a red one. That's a shorting opportunity. This week we had a red three going below a red two. That's another shorting opportunity. Okay. Now we're still being held up by the 200 week moving average, but the fact that the 200 week moving average has to hold the price up again in a bear market is very, very bad. If it was, if you see, if this average was holding up the price in an uptrend, it would be great. It would be another buying opportunity, but it's holding up the price in a downtrend. So this is just, you just have to sit there and wait for the breakdown. Uh, so I am expecting a breakdown of uh of the moving average i think that the 3000 uh, support line is way too close to the moving average line i don't expect it to hold the price we can bounce from 2800 at to 5000 but i ultimately believe we are going to get a lot closer to 2000 than to 3000 uh before the bear market ends i haven't looked at any of these charts in forever uh here is the daily chart. Now the daily chart, I had this blue line up there and now we're fully below the red line. Once you had a full candle open and close below the red line, which happened to be the candle of January 21st. I think that was the day I got to Vegas. Uh, it will, you can put a fork in this thing cause it's done. And uh, that's what happened. We could not close above the blue line the entire time had one really good day that didn't last. That was January 26th. Uh, we are now at a brand new swing low. We are now at a brand new low close on a daily chart. The day ends at about two or three hours. And this is looking very, very bad. It's a four of nine. Uh, so we're looking at five more days of upside. This is way too close to be a double bottom on a longer term chart. Um, there's still a chance, a tiny chance, if this thing gets to 3250, 3200, that it's going sub three, I have like 99% certainty on that. Um, the 12 hour chart um, looks pretty much the same. It's on a five of nine. So the 12 hour chart can hit that nine in two days, right at the end of the month, we can rebound back to the moving average uh, before going lower. Uh, the four hour chart bounced very nicely yesterday off of a TD9 buy. Uh, that's a very nice looking chart. What, probably one of the reasons why we're not down so much today is because of this, because we did have our capitulation candle on a four hour chart on the eight candle. The nine candle showed you some strength. We have bounced for one to four, can one to four candles, and now it's time to go lower. So I think the bounce off the nine is over 
and now you're looking at lower prices and the moment you drop to the vicinity of the candle lows of yesterday uh, then it's uh, or early this morning it's pretty much an acceleration to the downside because the 12 hour and the daily and the weekly are all bearish uh, the one hour chart bounced on a sequential 13 again those that trade this indicator uh, should have seen that uh, I, I mean, and you also did get a nine, but the actual bounce came in a sequential 13. Um, I think this bounce is coming to an end. It almost made it to a nine on the upside, but it has reached the moving average. It cannot break the setup trend line. I think the price is about ready to reverse and head back down. Um, I don't even know what this is. Oh, I think that's my short, that's my five minute chart. We used it for trading. I don't need that. This is a test that we did during a workshop as well. I don't need that. Uh, longs versus shorts. I have no idea where my graph is. I don't know what's going on here, so I don't have time. Uh, GBTC premium is not going it, to... It, the premium looks good, but the price should be falling. Uh, gold. Oh, gold went up. I don't know what this means. I haven't had, I didn't even realize that we broke my trend line. I had absolutely no idea. I did not expect us to break the trend line. Uh, we are now sitting on a weekly nine, check it against the daily chart. I, I mean, it's possible gold is going to go to a hundred million dollars an ounce, uh, but I'm still a little skeptical. Uh, I would let this nine play out and then reevaluate. I'll talk about gold in the future. S&P, uh, where are we here? I don't need a 10 minute chart of the S&P. Let's go to the daily S&P, very curious. S&P is holding up really, really well. I am very optimistic here on the S&P 500. I like the stabilization above 2,600. The longer we can stabilize above 2,600, the more bullish I become of the S&P 500. Uh, here is the, I'm gonna take a look at the weekly view on, on the cash market. And the weekly view is still a little scary. You're about to have a weekly death cross in a couple of weeks. Uh, this, this is gonna be an interesting situation. The daily looks good. The weekly is still has a lot to go. Okay, that's it guys. Um, I, I have workshops. Oh, new workshops, I almost forgot. So, uh, we put together new workshops. More workshops are coming. Uh, we have added Bangkok because I'll be there and we added Vienna because I'll be there. We will be adding New York and potentially other cities, uh, maybe Hong Kong, a big maybe on that. Uh, and uh, I also might be in Egypt. Uh, there's still just a lot of scheduling to be done. But right now, there's still very few seats left in London. That's in two weeks. And um, I did have to cancel the Paris one uh, due to uh, low demand in Paris, but that's okay. London, Bangkok, Vienna, those are up for sale. There'll be three more up here within a week or so. And once we nail down the dates, all right, guys, I gotta get to the airport. I gotta pack and get to the airport. I'll be in Paris at this by this time tomorrow, uh, way earlier than this time tomorrow, actually. And uh, hopefully I'll see some of you there. And thank you for watching. We're closing out with almost a thousand viewers. Uh, thank you so much for those that attended Unconfiscatable Conference. I really should have spent this week and like talk about the conference, what went right, what went wrong. 90% of the things went right. It was absolutely awesome. I wanna thank everyone, uh, the speakers. Absolutely, we are doing it again. And maybe a few other events similar to that around the world. Getting speakers is not always easy. Uh, because people have lives. So uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, thank you for all the support. Thank you to those that attended. Thank you for those watching the live stream of the event. And I will see you all on the next one.